Hey subscribers, thank you so much for joining me today. I am Jeremy, this is the Financial Education Channel, and today we have story time. I am going to tell you a story about three different companies that stock have gone up over 10,000% since the year 2000. I'm going to tell you what three companies they are, and with each company, I'm going to go into detail on how it happened. History repeats itself over and over and over again, and it's important to know these stories about some of these stocks that have just gone up insane amounts over the last 10 or 15 years, because maybe you in the future can potentially see one of these type of situations coming. You can follow a stock that's maybe a small company and whatnot, and you see, hey, you know what? This has some characteristics that are similar to such and such company. So this is why this is exciting. I'm looking so forward to telling you these three stories. You may know one of them. I don't know. You're probably not going to know the other two. We'll see. It depends on how much your investing knowledge you guys have. So the first company we're talking about, it's a little company, well, was a little company called Hanson's Natural Beverage. Hanson's Natural Beverage in the year 2000, they were just a small apple cider and apple juice selling company. And they sold to specialty grocery markets. They sold to some big supermarkets, but relatively they were a small company, a 15 to $25 million market cap. So a big company if you're someone like a normal person, but in the world of public companies, that's like the teeniest, teeniest, tiniest little company out there. So they were just moseying along. And then Herbert Hansen and his other co-founder of the company, they began to see, hey, you know what? This energy drink you know, thing is starting to become popular. There's this Red Bull that started coming over in the late 90s into the United States and expanding in Europe and stuff. And people are liking this. And it's like $3 a can. It's pretty expensive. There are good margins on this product. It's really starting to take off. Hmm, maybe we should get involved with that. So they decided they were going to get involved with that. And they came out with a little, little, or I shouldn't say a little can. It was actually twice the size of the Red Bull at that time. Red Bull at that time was 8.4 ounces. They came out with a 16.9 ounce can of what's now known as Monster Energy. And this Monster Energy just started slowly expanding around the United States. It went from one store to one store and they just started out that way. Now there are rumors, now these are strictly rumors that I've heard, that in the very earliest days of Monster Energy, they would distribute it to say a gas station or whatnot, get them to buy a couple cases. Then, you know, the gas station or mom and pop shop or whatever would say, okay, you know what, we'll keep this on our shelves for a month, we'll see if it sells. So the rumor is that in those early days, before people knew Monster Energy and whatnot and knew to buy the product, they would actually go in and buy the cans off the shelf here and there to help out sales, which then the, gro the grocery stores or the convenience stores then thought, wow, this is selling really, really well. So let's go ahead and keep this, or let's order a couple more cases. You know, let's keep this for at least six months now. This is a great product. And so Monster, we get to stay on the shelves. Then that inventory just came back to Monster Energy. No one knows if that story is true. It's a rumor that's been out there for a long time. Anybody that's followed the company. And who knows if it's true. But regardless, Monster just kept expanding, kept expanding into new products. As far as energy related, they started with coffee. They got into coffee products. They got into sugar-free products. They got into all these different type of flavors with juices and whatnot. Now Monster Energy is one of the biggest beverage companies in the entire world. Coca-Cola invested in them two years ago, a substantial amount of money, and now Coca-Cola owns around 15-20% of the company. Monster Energy stock price since 2000 is up well over 40,000%. 40,000%. All from basically launching the Monster Energy brand. Now, they've funneled money into other products like uh, it's called like Herbert's Lemonade and things like that in the glass bottles and they're really nice and whatnot in other type of drink categories, but let's not kid ourselves. The majority of the revenue and profits for that company and what's made that company what they are, it's Monster Energy. 
That's the story of Monster Energy, and that's the first stock today. Stock number two is this company named Apple, Apple Computer. So Apple was near bankruptcy. And I just want to say this before I go into it. Can you imagine the biggest, most profitable company we've ever known in history now was almost bankrupt less than 20 years ago, almost bankrupt. The type of comeback Apple came on is like some guy who was like homeless and fell off a cliff and broke all his bones and then somehow healed up, then somehow made himself a success, then somehow became president of the United States. That is the equivalent of what happened with Apple. When you go from near bankruptcy to becoming the most profitable, the most important company in the world in history, it's a ridiculous story. So Steve Jobs came back to Apple in 1997. Many of you probably know that. His first thing was, hey, we need to clean up these products. They had a lot of products that weren't very consumer friendly. They had too many things going in too many areas. And he said, we're going to simplify everything. So over the next couple years, that's exactly what he did. He cleaned up the complete lineup of Apple products to simplify things so consumers can understand what's an Apple product versus, you know, there's all these different models of this and that and this and that. And he got a very clear future on where he wanted the company to go, which was mobile. Mobile type devices. He saw that vision. Steve Jobs did. He also, and this is very underrated, and this is something no one talks about. He brought in extremely, extremely bright and very important business people to be on the board of directors. The type of people that a company's Apple size and with Apple being near bankruptcy at that time and basically a nothing company, the fact that he was able to get these type of people on the board of directors and bring in the kind of CEO or not CEOs, the other type of executives he did, that is unbelievable. You want to talk about a man that was a salesman and that never gets talked about in Apple's story. It just gets talked about about Steve Jobs and he did everything. No, he brought in so many great people. And that's part of a great executive, a great person that runs a company, bringing in people that are like brilliant to help you run this business and take it to the next level and take it to way, way further out than where you're at. So he did that. He brought in so many important people. You could go look back and it's like, how did he get those people to be on the board of directors? How did he get that person to be the chief operating officer? This and that. It's unbelievable. So He brought those people in. He cleaned up the product line. And in 2001, Apple launched the iPod, the first iPod. And iPod sales began to slowly but surely take off, take off and completely transform Apple from a company that was near pretty much not even profitable to a company that began to get very profitable. And then the iTunes store came around around 2003 and that propelled Apple to huge success. Now, how did, how did they do that? Because weren't there other people creating MP3 players and things? Yes, absolutely. Matter of fact, a short story, I had an MP3 player that was made by Philips and the technology was 10 times better than what the iPad had. Or excuse me, the iPad, the iPod had. This Philips MP3 player I had that my parents bought me, I was in middle school at that time, I think it was in the eighth grade. And by the way, all the cool kids had iPods. That was like the cool thing because Apple's like brilliant marketing. But anyways, the Philips device I had, it was touchscreen. Touchscreen was something Apple didn't even have in their vocabulary back then. Apple back then, it was like the turn wheel and stuff. If you guys remember the original iPods, that's what they were. This was a touchscreen display. Kind of like we have on smartphones now. That's way advanced stuff for that time. I could play videos on it. Like I could put a movie on it or a show or whatever. This was like ridiculous. The tech was way better than what Apple had. But what did Apple succeed with? They succeeded that they had the whole thing. They had the iPad, the iPod. They had the accessories for those iPods. Then they had the fact that they had iTunes and everything worked very seamlessly. And then they had the marketing. The marketing is so important. Steve Jobs, it's one of the things he focused on so much his first couple years back at Apple. How do we market Apple to consumers? How do we do it? And his marketing back then was unbelievable. On the way it attracted young people, 
And young people are very important when you're trying to make something cool. When you're trying to make something cool, you need teenagers to hit it. You need people in their 20s. You need people like that. And then they make it cool. And then everybody else kind of attracts to it after that. They make it cool and everybody else kind of attracts to it. So the fact that he could market so well and then they built on that success for the next six years until 2007 rolled around and they launched the iPhone. Now the iPhone, a lot of people were like, why is Apple doing a phone? What do they have in the phone business? So many questions, so many questions. You could go back on YouTube and type in old Steve Jobs interviews after the first iPhone was launched and by the investor community and whatnot. And they would ask questions like, why are you even doing this? You know, things like that. It's so competitive, this and that. And Steve Jobs' take was, hey, you know what? We have a vision for this. We think it's going to be successful. There's a billion devices. He, this is a specific quote from him. He said, there's a billion cell phones sold last year. If we can just get 1% market share, we'll sell 10 million units next year. That was his vision, and it became true. 10 million units, that was more, way more than Apple was selling any other device. So why not try to throw your cards in that type of business? Nowadays, Apple has around a 50% market share in North America. It's ridiculous. And now they, you know, they went on from iPhone to iPad, and they're in a lot of different products now. Apple Watch. You could argue that maybe Apple is getting a little too many products in there now. Apple has so many products in the game, you could argue that that may hurt them, and they might start reverting back to the old Apple. We'll see. We'll see how all that plays out over the coming years and whatnot. We don't know. I can tell you that when before Steve Jobs passed away, Apple was three to five years in front of everyone technology-wise. Like when the iPad launched, there was nothing close to the iPad as far as the software went, the hardware went, the way the whole device worked. There was nothing close to it. The same thing with the iPhone. And now you look and people you know, say Apple doesn't even have the most advanced products now. Anyways, that's just a side note. The bottom line is Apple's up over 10,000% since 2000. And maybe you can see that in future electronics companies. We will see as time goes on. Number three company, the last one, is a company called Keurig Green Mountain. So what this company is, is a company that was started in 1998. This guy founded a company called Keurig, and it made these little K-cups that went into coffee makers and the coffee makers were like not like a normal coffee maker it was a little like pressurized machine so you put this little k-cup in it you put it down and it makes you a pressurized cup of coffee and it tasted great and all these things so his that was his vision and he's gonna totally change the whole coffee industry so he starts out and he markets the products to offices in new york and massachusetts so slowly but surely, they start to roll these units out. And when they install one of these big units in an office, they actually are losing money. But they make it back by selling the K-Cups. So over time, he begins to get more and more success. By 2004, he's done 10,000 units. He has over 10,000 units in offices. Phenomenal. Now, the first company to get placed into the K-Cups the, for the coffee well, the first company to do that was a company named Green Mountain Coffee Roasters. They were just a little publicly traded company that was a little coffee company, basically, that sold raw coffee and those kinds of things. They were the first ones to get into onto this technology and whatnot and say, hey, we want our coffee to be in that. We'd be happy to. So as time went on, 2004 rolls around, and Keurig, they say, okay, you know what? I think there's bigger potential out here. Consumers want this. So they begin to market toward consumers and they come out with a consumer device in 2004 that's small enough to fit on your counter, all those kinds of things, and sales really begin to take off. This is when Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, they actually acquire Keurig. And the two companies together at that time had a lot more power, a lot more leverage together, a lot more money behind them, and they began to expand so fast, so fast. And over the coming decade, basically, they just went like this as far as growth. They went up like insane revenue, profits, everything. That stock is one of the best performing. It was up 30, 40,000 percent over the last decade. And it's really the success of the K Cup. And then in 2012, the patent finally ran out on that. So they started facing stiffer competition. 
But at that point, they had already had brand deals with Starbucks, brand deals with Dunkin' Donuts, brand deals with Campbell's, anybody who was anybody that wanted their name on that Keurig little K-cup. They wanted that because they wanted that potential revenue to come through their door. So that is such a success. And last year, the company was sold for $14 billion. $14 billion. The company was sold to a private equity fund. Unbelievable. And what a great performing stock. So now knowing these stories, I hope you guys can then maybe see something in the potential. Now, I want to warn you. It's very easy to say, oh, you know what? That company's going to do it. That company, they're small. And you know what? They're trying to get into some new product. And you know what? That's going to take off. It doesn't work like that. There's so many variables that go into it that you really have to pay attention to. And it's not as easy as just saying, I'm going to throw some money at this stock because there's going to grow. You need to see all these different variables. That's why I mentioned multiple things on why these companies were successful. You know, like specifically Apple, you know, it wasn't just that, you know, Steve Jobs came back. It was that he brought in all these talented people on the board of directors. He brought in all these talented people on the executive team. He had a vision as far as cleaning up the lines and whatnot, the product lines. He explained this to the investment community and to the consumer community. He had a vision. So, and then he made it happen slowly but surely. So if you would have seen the iPod coming at that time, that would have been a great time to invest in Apple. Anyways, thank you so much for watching today, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a comment in the comment section if you enjoyed these stories. I enjoyed telling them to you. I think they're really important, and I think they're just awesome stories on insane percentage gains you could have got on stocks if you were investing back then. Think about it. You could have invested a few thousand dollars or $10,000 or whatever. You'd be a multimillionaire now if you would invest in those stocks. It's unbelievable. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't subscribed, you may want to. I talk a ton about personal finance, talk about the stock market like we did today. I talk about entrepreneurship. I'm a young entrepreneur. I give a lot of tips. Subscribe, please. And you know what, guys? Have a great day.